say amen to that this morning. Does that not excite your heart and your soul to know that we're almost home? This thing's wrapping up in a hurry. We're nearer home than we were yesterday. Thank God for his blessings. I don't know about you, but I feel such a peace of God here this morning. Praise God for his blessings on us. Thank you so much for coming, being with us today, a very special day, and we had a wonderful time yesterday. I really appreciate all that everyone did, everyone that came out. It was just a special time of uh, meet and greet and uh, the food, the fellowship, and the video, the skits, everything that was said and done. It just touched my heart, and uh, I will never forget it. It was just a very special day. I'm getting older, evidently, 50 years in ministry. I still can't believe it. I'm still trying to comprehend that, but for the years go, come and go in a hurry, but I'm thankful to be here, and I'm thankful to be living now. I believe that we're on the brink of the second coming of Jesus Christ, and I'm getting excited about leaving this world. Praise God. We're delighted to have you that are visiting with us today. I wonder, do we have any first-time visitors? Can I see your hand? Anybody here for the very first time? Over here, God bless you. Anyone else? We're glad to have you. Any returning visitors? Let me see your hand. You've been here before, but you came back for more. Praise God. Good to see the Coopers with us today. Nestlers all the way from Caldwell County. Some of our former members are glad to have them with us today. The Stars are here today. So many folks. The Rushings. Sister Priscilla Hensley on the piano over here tickling the ivories. Delighted to have them. And, and aren't we blessed today to have our general overseer, Brother Tim Hill, with us in service. We are so honored to have him with us. Praise God. And I'm looking forward to hearing him sing and preach. We're just here to have church today. Praise God. We're here to worship the Lord and thank God for the privilege we have to serve him, to live for him, and to experience what we experience. The blessings of the Lord are for all. Praise God. If you need a blessing and you're ready today, you're in the right place, God has a blessing with your name on it. Would you stand, please, as we go to the Lord in prayer and pray God's blessing. Sister Garner Sheehan asked us to pray for her, she had planned on being here today, but her sister uh, suffered a mild heart attack. Pray God would touch her, be with her. Also, one of our pastors is having surgery this morning with the Wade Foster. Pray God would touch him and be with him. There's so many people in need of prayer, but we know God hears and answers prayer. And especially pray for those that are lost, that they'll be saved. Pray God's anointing on this service. Father, we thank you today for once again allowing us to come together in your house to worship you. Thank you. For your blessings. Thank you for protecting us, keeping us all this week long. And Lord, for this day, we rejoice. We celebrate, Lord. We rejoice in you because of what you've done for us, for your faithfulness to us. You've been so faithful to me. I thank you, God, for hearing the prayers of the saints, for ministering to every need today. We ask you to touch these that are sick and suffering. We know that with your stripes we are healed. We believe for their healing and their deliverance, especially for those that are lost. They would call upon your name to be saved. We pray, God, your will might be accomplished. Everything that's said and everything that's done will give you all the praise and all the glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and ask it all. Amen and amen. Would you take a moment now and welcome one another to the Matthews Church of God. We're delighted to have you with us today. Matthew's Church of God. What a beautiful day in the Lord we have. 
Let's go ahead and go to the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. Psalm 34 and 1 says this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. As children of the one true God, we possess an inherent desire to worship all day and to worship all night. Admittedly, though, our jobs take up so much of the time that could be spent in doing just that. So how do we at least somewhat make up for that lost worship? Well, we can pay our tithes because we must understand that paying our tithes is a form of worship. Think of it this way. Cain was a successful farmer, and he chose to offer just a few vegetables. He should have made the connection between his financial gain and an opportunity he had to worship God. He did not see that connection. My prayer today is that we do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, beautiful Father, wonderful Father, Father who takes care of everything, all of our needs. You've been there yesterday, you're here today, and you're going to be here tomorrow. You pick us up when we fall. Lord, you provide all that we need. Lord, you're so good to us. We thank you so much for everything you've done, just being in our presence. Lord, we want to thank you right here, right now, for the wonderful pastor and and. and and Sister Brackett, that you gave to us, that you sent to us, that they would come and speak the word to us and feed us every day and to guide us and pray for us, Lord. We are so blessed to have them in our lives. Lord Jesus, we're so blessed to be here today. You've given us a desire to come and worship you and to love on you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you've done, what you're going to continue to do in your son's beautiful name, Jesus Christ. Amen. dark and so low the sun did not shine there but a lily did grow I cried to my father how can this be he said can't you see child I am
and give God praise. Hallelujah. Come on right now. Can you just lift your hands to him and just honor his presence that's in this place? Hallelujah. Oh, come on. He's worthy of our praise. He woke us up this morning. You've got a right to praise him. Come on, sing this. You deserve the glory and the honor So we lift our hands in worship. Come on, church. As we lift your holy name, you deserve the glory. All to you, Jesus. And the honor. Come on, think about him. So we lift our hands in worship. Come on, help me worship him. As we lift your holy name.
9,000 churches in 185 countries and territories worldwide. Dr. Hill previously served as a member of the Executive Committee, Secretary General, and Assistant General Overseer, and has been an Administrative Bishop in two states. He is the author of nine books and 150 gospel songs, and at the core of Dr. Hill's ministry is his passion for revival and completing the Great Commission. What a blessing honor and joy it is to have Dr. Hill with us today as we celebrate this milestone celebration of our Bishop Rackett's 50th year in ministry. We are excited that you are here and we extend you the warmest Matthews welcome. Hallelujah. Thank you, Sister Amy. Well, let's give the Lord praise today. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. What a wonderful time we're having today. God bless you as you're seated. Such a joy to be with you this morning on such a special occasion. What a wonderful honor it is to me to get to be here on such a grand day to celebrate Brother and Sister Brackett's wonderful anniversary of ministry. Daryl and Gail are treasures to the church of God, to the kingdom of God, and I know to all of you in particular. Their 50th anniversary, your 67th anniversary, I've been told. What else can we celebrate today? My goodness, this is just a big day, isn't it? Well, let's celebrate the goodness of the Lord on any occasion, any day. God is great and greatly to be praised. I've never been anywhere where I enjoyed the atmosphere of praise like I have here this morning. The music, the choir, it's just been incredible. And I want to tell you, I am just surrounded up here today by tremendous musicians. It's good to see Sister Hensley and Sister Rushing, and these that are playing instruments today. You've just got it going on here today. And what a beautiful church this is. Man, this is one beautiful place I love these windows and the majesty that they portray and those colors and the messages that they send forth. It's just good to be here. You know, I'm just glad to be in North Carolina. I'm glad to be at a place where they know what to do with barbecue. Amen. I travel all over this country and some folks think they know, but they don't know. But North Carolina knows. Depends on what side of the state you're on. You know, you just kind of have to pick and choose which flavor you like. But I like it all. That's my problem. I like it all. But thank you, Pastor. You know, I'm, I'm making this date up. I think I was supposed to be here about a year and a half ago. And uh, we had a death in the church that I was asked to go and speak at one of our former overseers. But I'm glad you didn't give up on me. I'm glad you didn't forget about me. Now, I've got to tell you, when I walked in today, there's a young man sitting on this front row. He is a rush of personality. I mean, he introduced himself right up front and said, I'm Alex, and I thought he was the pastor there for a moment. My goodness, Alex, wow. You will be the general overseer of the Church of God someday. I'm just absolutely convinced. I wouldn't be a bit surprised by that. <laughs> oh. Well, you know what? For me to sit down at a piano when Sister Hensley is here is really not smart. It's just not smart. I've, I've been watching you play for a long time, and you do such a marvelous job. Do I want to sing with this mic that's on this stand? Is that what I want to do? Can I do that? But uh, 
I'm going to do my best. And she's sitting over here watching me. Can you believe that? That is like a, that is like a piano teacher watching a first grade student at a recital. Ooh, I love the, I love the key action of this piano. It's good, isn't it? Isn't it, isn't it great? Well, it's so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to on his promise just to know thus said the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I I learn how to trust him. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that he'll be with me. He'll be with me till the end. Jesus, Jesus, how. Trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Sing that last line, oh, for grace to trust trust him today a little lady walked up to me a few minutes ago and said that she had heard me sing this song a couple of years ago after her husband passed away and I'm not going to sing all of it but just let me do a course for her and if you've ever heard it I hope it blessed you if you haven't I hope it'll bless you today in the me of it all, in the midst of it all, I found hope that will never let me fall. Jesus heard my
I'll give him praise in this house. Now, you know what? When, when I go to a church and start feeling real relaxed and comfortable, that's a dangerous thing. Because I have a plane to catch this afternoon, and I may not make it. So y'all have to pray for me here. Uh, wh where's that trio that was up here singing? All those men that were up here singing, did they, did they go out for coffee, or are they still in here? Where you at, guys? Where you at? Where you at? Come up here. Come up here. They're pointing. There's one back there at the sound booth. Where's the other two? There, there's two back at the sound booth. You can always tell a quartet or a trio. They hang around the soundboard. All right, here they come. Come on up here, guys. Grab a microphone. Now, this is totally, totally unrehearsed, isn't it? Have I ever met you guys before? I don't even know your name, do I? I sound like one of those TV preachers that's getting ready to do something wild, or I don't know who you are. All right. Y'all look old enough to know this song. This is the first song that I really remember singing publicly in all my life. I was seven or eight years old, and I was sitting in the back of the Texas camp meeting tabernacle with my mom and dad the last night of a camp meeting. And uh, I'd been singing a little bit, not much, but a little bit in my dad's church, small church in Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, the state overseer had heard about it, and he thought it would be real cute if a fat, freckle-faced, red-headed kid would get up on the last night of a camp meeting when nothing could be damaged by that point. And so they pulled me up there, stood me on top of a piano bench, and said, Sing, son. And the only song I could think of was a song that Mama had been playing on the old record player. Dad had been off to a Sunday school convention somewhere, and he brought back some long play albums. Anybody remember long play albums? Um, you're telling how old you are now. And uh, there, was, there was a group called the Happy Goodman Family on a couple of those albums. And the song that Mama would always play was the first song on one side of that album. She didn't care about the rest of the album, but she'd play that one song, pick up the needle, and back it up, and play it all over again. And uh, that's the only song I could think of. And, and I'm standing on that piano bench singing this song, and the first word said, I started out traveling for the Lord many years ago. Now, I was seven years old. I hadn't been down the street much. But I kept on singing. I've had a lot of heartache, met a lot of grief and woe. Now, the only woe a seven-year-old had ever known at that point in time was what his mama had given him. But I kept on singing, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. You guys ever heard that? So y'all find a part, just stay off mine, okay? We'll be all right. Uh, when I get on that course, you jump in and act like you know what you're doing, okay? I started out traveling for the Lord many years ago. I've had a lot of heartache, met a lot of grief, and woe. But when I would stumble, then I would humble down. And there would say I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Well, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Gotta make it to heaven somehow. Though the devil tipped me and he tried to turn me around. He's offered everything that's got a name, all the wealth I want, the worldly fame. But if I could still, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. There's nothing in the world that'll ever take the place of God's love. All the silver and gold can ever buy a mighty touch from above. Oh, no, when my soul needs healing and I begin to feel in his power, I can say, thank the Lord, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Well, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. God, I make it to heaven somehow. The old devil tipped me and he tried to turn me around. He's offered everything that's got a name, all the wealth I want. The worldly pain, but if I could still, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. No, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Gotta make it to hell somehow. Though the devil tipped me and he tried to turn me around. He's offered everything that's got a name, all the wealth I want. The worldly pain, but if I could still, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. If I could still, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. and put that on the road right there. 
man, I don't want to stop there. There's nothing in the world that'll ever take the place of God's love. All the silver and gold can ever buy a mighty touch from above. When my soul needs healing and I begin to feel it is power. I can say thank God I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Well, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Gotta make it to heaven somehow. Though the devil tempt me and he tries to turn me around. He's all but everything that's got a name. All the wealth I want, the worldly pain. But if I could still, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. If I could still, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Woo! My goodness. <laughs> Come on out here. Let me find out who you are. Y'all have a name for your trio? Well, not really. <laughs> the not really trio. I guess so. <laughs> I got a name for us. All right. Three aches and a pain. How's that? <laughs> guess who the pain is? That's me. All right. Give them a God bless you. That was incredible. My, 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 my. <laughs> uh, you can sit down if you can. That was fun. I like that. Now, they're just like every quartet. They're going out to find coffee right now. I know what they're doing. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. In just a few moments, I'm going to speak from Philippians, the book of Philippians chapter 3. And uh, after I sing, there is, a, there is a transitional time that I use before I start preaching. And the reason I use that is because... I'm out of breath. <laughs> and Troy, it takes me longer than it used to to rev it up. So y'all just uh, bear with me for a moment. You sing a song like that that fast, it takes something out of you. Not to mention that I'm 61 now. Don't tell anybody that, but uh, that has a little bit to do with it. What a joy, Pastor. Congratulations on 50 years. Wow. Can you imagine... Can you imagine how many sermons, how many prayers to get ready for those sermons, how many souls that came to Christ as a result of the preaching of the gospel? But here's the truth. He wouldn't be worth half a hallelujah without Gail sitting right there. We all know that. That's the way it is in my ministry, in my life, Paula makes the difference for me, and I know Gail does for Brother Darrell. When you leave today, my office sent just a few copies of my brand new book. This book is not even two months old, and I'm not going to speak anything about it today, but uh, it's called Furnace Grace, How to Live When the Heat's Turned Up. And it came out of the life that I've lived this last year and a half, doing my best to hear the leading of the Lord as I tried my best to lead this church through a very, very difficult time through this global pandemic. God has helped us. So many wonderful things have happened. We've learned a lot of things. But uh, I was sitting with my staff the other day and just talking about some of the principles that I learned during this period. And I felt impressed to just put them in a book. And I think they sent about 20 copies today. And if you get that book, I'm just going to pitch in a CD that I made some time back called Hallelujah Moments. A lot of upbeat, good camp meeting songs and some of the old favorites are on there. So you just go by and somebody will be out there to help you after service. Now I want to do my best to uh, speak not only to the occasion of a wonderful man of God that has served the Lord very faithfully, but I also want to speak to you. I want to do my best to impart to you today and instill into your spirit today things that I believe will help you on your journey and how to finish well and how to come to a place in your life where you can celebrate the wonderful things that God has deposited in you to make you a stronger Christian and a stronger child of God. I guess when I think about any occasion like this of a pastor's 50th anniversary in ministry or a church's 67th anniversary in ministry, I have, to, I have to ask a very fundamental question. It's not a profound question, but a fundamental question. 
That is how. How? How'd you do it? Pastor, how have you done this for 50 years? How have I done it for 44? How have you done it for 67? How have you done it as a family committed and dedicated to God? I want to talk about that today. How do we do this? And I think it's found in something that Paul says in the third chapter of the book of Philippians. And really, this is my favorite portion of this book. I love this section right here. Chapter 3, verse 10, when Paul begins by saying that I may know him. Folks, that's what it boils down to. That's the foundation. And when Paul says that I may know him, he's not talking about a relationship of mere acquaintance. He's not talking about having an arm's length distant rapport with somebody. He's talking about an intimacy here, that I may know him. When I hear Paul use that phrase, Paul is saying, I'm striving for something in my walk with God. I want to know him so well that I can lean my head back upon his chest and hear the beat of his heart. I want a relationship with Christ so much that uh, I can absolutely climb on that cross with him and say, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you hear that desire and that passion to want to know Jesus like that? I can hear the Apostle Paul with this phrase also say this. Here's where I want to go with him. I want to go so far with him and so deep in him that I'm able to say I'm crucified with Christ. Don't want what I used to want. Don't go where I used to go. Don't crave what I used to crave because old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. That's the depth that I'm after here that I may know him. And here's the levels. And the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Being made conformable unto his death. What in the world does that even mean? To be made conformable unto his death. One writer that I read after put it this way. He said he believed that Paul was saying, I want you to see in my living what you saw in his dying. I want to walk out in shoe leather what he died to obtain on the cross. I want to conform to what he purchased. Man, I feel like preaching here. You want to start a revival tonight, buddy Jay? I want to conform to that. I want to, I want to transform. I want to become the very reason for which he died. Then he goes further. He says, I'm not there yet. I, I confess to you I've not achieved that. I've not attained that. I'm not already perfect in verse 12. But he said, here's what I'm doing about that. I'm following after him. If that I may apprehend that for which also I was apprehended of Christ Jesus. Get the picture here. Paul is actually saying to us, I was minding my own business one day. And it's like that old game of tag we used to play as children. It's like the Holy Ghost slapped me on the shoulder and said, Tag, Paul, you're it. Now chase me. And Paul said, I'm doing myself to chase him so that I can catch him and apprehend him because that's why he apprehended me. That I may apprehend him and pursue him. Oh, you hear the struggle that Paul is wrestling with here. I want that. I'm after that. I'm not there yet. I'm struggling to get there. Then he gets into verse 13 and he says, here's some principles that I've laid out that are going to help me do it. He says, I count not myself to apprehend it, but this one thing I do. Forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things which are before, I press. It's a press, Pastor. It's a press. I press toward, may not be going far, may not be going fast, but I'm going forward. 
I press toward the mark, the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. How? How? How do you do this 50 years? How do you do this 67 years? You live by principles. It's not an accidental thing. It's not a haphazard thing to just walk up into this pulpit Sunday after Sunday for all these years and open up a Bible and take a text and just read and share what's ever on your heart. You don't do it that way. It's not some haphazard thing to raise a family in ministry. We live in a glass house. You're concerned and you're consumed with so many things about ministry and yet you You have to raise a family and you want to raise a family to love God like you love God. It's not an accidental thing. You do it by principles. And Paul lays out the principles here. And I want to touch on just three of them and then I'm going to do my best to wrap this up. The principles that Paul lays out here are very simple in some ways, yet profound in others. Paul, first of all, says, here's how we do it. We live by the principle of concentration. Concentration. When Paul says this, one thing I do, one thing, not two, not five, not seven, not 28, I'm giving myself to one primary thing, and that is I want to keep a smile on the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to please the Lord because here's the deal, it doesn't matter who you please in this life if you don't please Jesus. You can knock yourself out, wear yourself down, and drive yourself crazy trying to please everybody else. But pastor can tell you, if you don't please Jesus, it didn't matter who you did please. So Paul says, here's how it gets done. You live by the principle of concentration. You put all the periphery aside and you focus on Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean you're always going to make everybody else happy, but someday you're going to hear him say, well done, my good and my faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. It's the principle of concentration. I was reading my Bible the other day, sitting on an airplane on my way to Texas, and I opened up to Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, and I was reading what Jesus said to the churches of Asia Minor. He started with the church at Ephesus and ended with the church of Laodicea, but to the church at Ephesus, he said this, you are doing so many wonderful things. I love you for every one of them. I'm so proud of you. You feed the hungry. You clothe the poor. You minister hope to so many people. But he said, I do have one thing against you. Now, folks, it really doesn't matter how much good you've done when you come down to the bottom of the list and the Lord Jesus himself says, got one thing against you. That one thing kind of nullifies everything else. And Jesus says to Ephesus, he says, here's the one thing I have against you. Of your own free will, your own volition, your own choice, you have left your first love. Notice what he said and what he didn't say. He didn't say you don't love me at all. What he said was, you don't love me like you used to. And I wonder if after 67 years, we love Jesus like we did 67 years ago. Do we love Jesus like we did this time last week? Can we sing the song every day with Jesus is really sweeter than the day before? I want to tell you, my friend, there comes a point in time when we have to stop and take inventory quite regularly and check on the heart factor and the love factor. And say, Jesus, i just got to confess to you. I've got to admit to you, I need you now more than I ever have. I'm not so saved. I'm not so sanctified. I'm not so filled with the Holy Ghost that I don't need you more today than I did 10 years ago or 50 years ago. I want to tell you, we have to live by the principle of concentration so that we're able to stand and testify and say, this one thing I do, this one person I will serve, this one power I will believe in, I'm not going to get cumbered down by the cares of this life. I'm going to focus on one central character and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. He has no contemporary. He has no competition in my life. It's all Jesus. Somebody praise him in this house. David said it this way, one thing have I desired of the Lord and that will I seek after all the days of my life. Jesus himself put it this way, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness then all these things will be added unto you. One thing. That's the principle of concentration. Your pastor has concentrated on his relationship with Christ 
He's concentrated on shepherding you as a people. But then there's a second principle that explains how we got here. It's what I call the principle of cancellation. Cancellation. Paul said this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind. Now, Pastor, you didn't make it 50 years without employing the principle of cancellation. This church isn't here 67 years later without employing the principle of cancellation because I promise you in 67 years or in 50 years or in six months, there are things that come along life's way that if you would allow it, it would have hurt you bad enough to cause you to want to give up and quit. Somebody said something somewhere. Somebody did something somewhere. You went through something at some point in time that had you allowed your human emotions and your human carnality to take control, you would have said, that's it, I quit, I give up. But Paul says here, a child of God impacted by the power of the Spirit, he lives by the principle of cancellation. And what that means is that quite regularly, you have to lay out the contract of offense with all of its fine print of what somebody said and what somebody did and what you went through. And you got to take one of those old-fashioned rubber stamps that has the word canceled engraved in it, and you've got to dip it in the red blood of Jesus, and you've got to mark canceled on that contract of offense and say, devil, that's not going to steal my joy, and that's not going to steal my song, and it's not going to take me to hell. I'm going to live by the principle of cancellation that I may win Christ. This one thing I do, that's concentration. But I put all things behind me, that's cancellation. That I may win Jesus. Ah, but you don't know what I've been through, preacher. I understand that. And you don't know what they say. I understand. You don't know what they do. I understand that. But I also do know the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That whatever you've gone through, whatever you've encountered and experienced, you can put it beneath the blood of Jesus. And his blood washes away the hurt. And his blood washes away the disease appointment and his blood washes away the pain and sorrow and raises you up in the power of the Holy Ghost to face another day that's how you do it you live by the principle of cancellation lean over look at somebody and tell them cancel it now I got something on my mind I got to square away before I can finish preaching is your name Rick or Daryl? Where'd Daryl come from? That's your middle name? Well, thank God it's at least in the lineup. Because my secretary put on my notes here, Pastor, there it is, Rick Daryl Brackett. I just went, y'all didn't even know his name was Daryl, did you? You didn't want him to know either, did you? Here's what you do. Cancel it. See, right there, right there, my secretary put, you see that? What do you think I should do when I get back? Give her a raise. That's I see. Yeah, you're, you're soft like that. I, I'm up here preaching, and they put a sign back there on the screen. His name is Rick. Okay, well, hey, I'm up here trying to flow in the anointing, and there's a sign back there that says his name is Rick. You got it wrong. Somebody look back there and tell them to cancel it. Really, just cancel it. Now that we got that squared away, Sister Russian, I can finish preaching. No, I'm not through talking about canceling it yet. Let, let me talk to you about cancellation. <laughs> now, don't count this against my preaching time. I'm, I'm just going to testify here for a minute. I'll let you know when I start preaching again. Somebody one time that if I called his name, you'd know him well. He called me down to his office one day. He said, Tim, I need you to get on a plane, and he named this country, and go over to this place and make this announcement. And then he followed that up with these words, I hope you get back alive. 
I said, well, thank you very much. Now, what he asked me to do wasn't wrong. It wasn't sinful, but it sure was hard, Brother Troy. I didn't want anything to do with it. Because when you work on the executive committee of the Church of God, here, here's how that kind of comes down. The general overseer appoints every other member of the executive committee what is called a portfolio. What that means is if you're a first assistant, you might have the world missions portfolio. If you're a second assistant, you might have education. And third, and the secretary general has other things. And that's the way it works. Now, what he asked me to do wasn't wrong at all, but it wasn't in my portfolio. Another man had that responsibility. And I very politely reminded the general overseer at that time that that really belonged to somebody else. And as far as I was concerned, I wished he would do it and not me. Because I didn't want any part of it. It was a very unpopular announcement to have to go over there and make. And again, he said it twice. I hope you get back alive. He said, yeah, but you've got the drive and you've got the ambition and you've got the personality. You can go get it done. So go get it done. Here's what he never knew. I was mad, I was sad, and I was bad. I was everything that rhymed with mad, sad, and bad except glad. So I left his office the next morning. I pushed myself out of my house at 4.30 to catch a commuter flight to Atlanta. I got to Atlanta by 6.30, and this thing has turned from aggravation into a bad spirit. I mean, it had really got on me. And I'm walking through the terminal in the Atlanta airport, going to the international terminal to catch this flight. I had a couple of hours and I'm just walking through that terminal, talking to myself and thinking, and, and, and it's a bad thing. It's a bad spirit. I, I realized that. I got under conviction fast. I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to feel this way about my leader. And Is there anything you can do to help me feel better right now? And so help me. I realized at that moment I was walking by the food court. I said, there's the answer right there. A good breakfast will make anybody feel better. Now let me describe breakfast to you. As a matter of fact, I'm of, the, I'm of the opinion the marriage supper of the Lamb is really a midnight breakfast buffet. I love breakfast better than any meal of the day. My idea of a good breakfast is two eggs over easy. Now, that's just my, my deal. I like them that way. Pepper those babies down. Touch of salt, but a lot of pepper. I like summer tomatoes. Pepper those babies down too. I like sausage gravy. Anybody feel the Holy Ghost yet? <laughs> sausage gravy poured on top of those what we call in Texas cat head biscuits. Now, depending on what part of the world I'm traveling in, they don't always know what a biscuit really is. I was in England one time and said, I'll have some biscuits with my eggs. They brought out a cookie. I said, that ain't what I'm talking about. She didn't have a clue. I love a good breakfast. And that's what I wanted that morning to just kind of comfort me and help me feel better about my assignment. So I go into this food court, but I didn't find that. Matter of fact, I settled for the world's sorriest bowl of cornflakes ever tried to eat. But they did have a biscuit, and it looked pretty decent behind the steamed glass. And I didn't realize until I got to my table that what looked good behind the steamed glass was burned black on the bottom and hard as a rock. It didn't flake, it didn't crumble, it just like a rock. And here I am at 6.30 in the morning trying to slosh through a sorry bowl of cornflakes with a biscuit you can't bite into and all this stuff I'd been feeling since the day before when the general overseer gave me that assignment. It came rushing back in on me and folks, I raised up my biscuit and started talking to it. Now, this is the guy you got preaching for you here this morning, a man who talks to his biscuit. I raised that biscuit up and I transferred every other member of the Church of God Executive Committee into that biscuit. I put a face on it and called them by name one person at a time and then I started baptizing them in 2% milk. I put a face and a name on it. I said, you should have done it. It was in your portfolio and I baptized him. Put another name on it and said, you should have done it. You could have done it easily. You're Mr. Suave and Debonair. Everybody loves you. You don't even sweat when you preach and I baptized him. Having myself a mad fit in that food court because of what I'd been asked to go do. And all of a sudden, in the middle of my fit, I heard somebody singing. 
There must have been 500 people milling about that food court. And I heard somebody singing from the other side of the room just as loud as they could. And here's what they were singing. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? His eyes on the sparrow and I know he watches me. And I pushed myself back. I said, who in the world is that? And I found an old man on the other side of that food court with a dish towel in his hand busting off a table cleaning up tables where people would sit down and mess them up. And he'd do that all morning, but he had the joy of the Lord in his heart. And the Lord started talking to me and said, why can't you be like him? He got up earlier than you did to come down here and go through the security process to make ends meet for he and his little wife somewhere. Why can't you just be happy about your service today? What you were asked to do isn't wrong. It's not sinful. Sure, it's a little hard, but you can do it. I'm going to give you strength to do it. Just get up and go do your job. You said when you were elected, you'll do whatever the general overseer asked you to do. So get up and go do it and shut up. Uh, Holy Ghost will talk mean to you sometimes. I said, you're right, Lord. I am so sorry. I apologize. And I'm going to apologize to the general overseer when I get back. He don't even know I'm upset, but I'll apologize to him and so I grab my roller bag and I'm just carting down toward gate 18. And all of a sudden the Holy Ghost stops and said, I'm not finished with you. I said, you're not? He said, no. He moved me back to that food court. And when I got close to the food court, he said, reach into your pocket. And the first bill your hands touch, pull it out of your pocket and give it to that old man for blessing you today. Now listen, I didn't have to reach into my pocket. I already knew what I had in my pocket. Alex, I had a 5 and a 20 and a $100 bill in my pocket. And the whole time I'm reaching into my pocket, I'm saying, come on, five, come on, five. I pulled it out. It was not the five. It was not the 20. It was the $100 bill. I stormed across that food court. I slapped that in that old man's hand. He said, what's that? I said, don't ask. I grabbed my bag, went down to gate 18. I promise you all the way down to the gate and through the jetway. I heard him still singing. I sing because I'm happy. Well, he should have been happy. He had $100 out of my pocket. But I tell you what he helped me do. That old man helped me cancel that spirit and cancel that attitude. And I got on that plane, went to another country and did my job. Listen, I didn't just come by to say happy anniversary. I didn't just come by to make you feel better about going 67 years. I came by to help somebody cancel something. I don't know what they said, but cancel it. I don't know what they did, but cancel it. I don't know what kind of valley you're going through, but cancel it. And don't lose your joy. I feel like preaching now. Don't lose your joy. In the Holy Ghost, cancel it. Somebody raise your hands and shout hallelujah. My Lord, I feel camp meeting breaking out in my soul now. Cancel it. Cancel it. My Lord, lay it all aside that you may win Christ. Praise God. Lean over and tell somebody, you know he's preaching to you, don't you? Just tell him. <laughs> Woo! I tell you what, if I didn't have to be somewhere tonight, I'd call a revival right now. May not be nobody here, but I'd call one. How'd you do it? Pastor Rick Brackett? Don't tell me I don't know who my pastors are. I know this man. He's got a middle name named Daryl. It is Gail, isn't it? Did I get that right? Yeah. So I got a sister named Gail. That's why I remembered that. Just better be glad I didn't call you Paula. I mean, that's, that's my wife's name, and that's, she's, she's the name on my mind all the time. How'd you do this? How'd you do this? 50 years. You live by the principle of concentration and cancellation. I'm just going to meddle right here. Can I meddle? You know, I'm late by a year and a half. I owe you a little time here. 
I can't speak for him. But I can speak for myself. I had spent a lot of time in an altar canceling some stuff. Because if the devil ever gets a foothold in my heart of bitterness and anger, then I lose my effect as a minister of the gospel. So I had to lay it out. Like Hezekiah laid it out on the altar and just say, there it is, God. Speak for yourself. I can't deal with it. I cancel it under the blood of Jesus. But that leads me to the third principle. How did you do it? You live by the principle of continuation. Paul said this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind, I press, get that picture, I press, I push, press toward the mark. Because there's a prize. That comes with this high calling. This high calling is not just floating out there without a prize. There's a, there's a prize attached to this calling. And if I fulfill the calling, I get the prize. And the prize is not just a starry crown. The prize is not just a beautiful robe. The prize is Jesus. I want to see Jesus. So if I'm going to see Jesus, I have to live by the principle of continuation. Not quitting. Not giving up. My old daddy went to heaven five years ago. One of dad's favorite sayings, I don't know where he got it, but one of dad's favorite sayings was, Son, the greatest test of your character will always be revealed in the one thing it takes to make you quit. Wow. So Paul says, I'm going to live by the principle of continuation because here's what I know, Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. I'm going to live by the principle of continuation because here's what I know, I'm troubled on every hand, yet not distressed, perplexed, but not in despair, cast down, but never destroyed persecuted but not forsaken. I'm living by the principle of continuation because here's what I know. There is no weapon formed against you that will prosper. I'm living by the principle of continuation because here's what I know. When I walk through the fire, the flame will not kindle upon me and through the waters the river shall not overflow me. I'm going to live by the principle of continuation because here's what I know. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemy. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell, I shall dwell, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm not giving up. I'm not quitting. I'm going to live on the principle of continuation. We press on. We persevere. We continue. This has been the most difficult year and a half for a church, for a pastor, for your families. But you're here today because you live by the principle of continuation. And you would not quit. My Lord, I feel him. Sister Hensley, come to that keyboard, if you don't mind, that piano. And don't worry about what you hear me sing. You just play Amazing Grace and we'll be okay, all right? I got a song to the tune of Amazing Grace. Whatever key you want to play it in is fine. Paul and I sat at our house a little over a year ago, right after Father's Day last year. We sat in our house for 23 days, didn't go anywhere. We had our time with this virus and our symptoms were very mild. It wasn't much at all. We just had a lot of fatigue issues more than anything. 
But on doctor's orders, we sat in our house for 21 days, and we gave him two more just to be careful. But on day 23, I looked at Paul. I said, I've had enough of this. I've got to have some sunshine. We're not going to get near anybody. We won't let anybody get near us. But let's get in the car and drive out in the country. So we got in the car. I pushed the sunroof back, and I just drove and let the sun shine on me. And while I was driving, I just started making up a song. I haven't written a good song in a long time. I, I've had 20 years of writer's block when it comes to songwriting. But I started riding along out in the country, sun shining on me, and I just started making up a song. And it dawned on me, I may really have something here. I may really have something here. So I said, Paula, let me sing you a verse of a song that I'm hearing. And see what you think. So I started singing, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. so far hold on hold on hold on hold on you're going to sing this next Sunday aren't you hold on hold on see now that's a sign of a good song when people pick it up like that Paula looked at me out of the corner of her eye she said, really? Really? I said, yeah, really. I said, I got a second verse, darling. And whether you want to hear it or not, I'm just going to drive in the country and sing my second verse. And it went like this. He will come through. He will come through. He will come convinced that I had written a legitimate song. So I said, I'm going to tell you how legitimate it is. I got a third verse. Only legitimate songs have three verses. So here's my third verse. I've come too far to turn back now. I've come too far Hold on, I've come too far to turn back now. I've come too far. Well, by that time I had to admit, you're right, darling. It's really not a legitimate song. I'm just out here so glad to be outside. I don't know what to do. I just thought I'd make something up. But I said, there is a legitimate song, and I want to sing verse 3 of it. Now, Sister Gail, if there's anything that I wouldn't want to be, it's the third verse of a song that's got four verses in it. Because you're going to get left out most of the time. Kind of like the gentle overseer, not knowing your first name. You, you're going to get left out most of the time. You can tell that didn't bother me at all today, can you? But I started singing verse 3 of this whole song. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have all. Has brought me 
saved the star and grace will lead me on. Now lift your hands and sing this. Praise God. 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 Oh, praise God. Praise God. Sing that. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Stand with me all over this house. My goodness. My goodness. Can I just tell you right out of the depths of my heart what I feel here today and I'm finished. God has his hands on this church in a very significant way. I like to believe that's everywhere, but I don't say that everywhere. But I'm going to say it here because I feel that deep in my soul. God has his hands on this church. And that happens for a number of reasons. It's because of a praying people, a dedicated people. But it's also because you have a good shepherd. A good shepherd. And in this day and time of superlatives, the world is always looking for a better adjective than good. Hollywood makes sure that there's always some explosive adjective that seems to exceed the word good. But I like the word good because it's a biblical term. When we face Jesus someday, that's what he'll say. Good, faithful servant. And I want to tell you, you have a good shepherd. and his companion. And I like to see them in tandem with one another as a dual ministry that God has set in this congregation to help touch this community. I want to do something today, and before I do it, I want to make sure that you know if you happen to be here today and you've never invited Jesus into your heart, you can do that right now doesn't matter what the theme of this service has been. It doesn't matter that it's been a celebration of a pastor or a congregation. You can ask Jesus into your heart, and he'll do that. He'll do that. Just simply stand there and say, Lord, come into my heart. I want to live by those principles that this preacher has talked about today. It's just that simple. But here's what I'd like to do. Pastor Brackett, you and Gail, if you don't mind. And, and I'd like your entire family that are here today. Would it be all right if I ask all of them to come stand with you? Do you work with a church board, a pastor's council, a deacons, whatever you call them? I want, I want that board, whatever you call them, to come and just stand with me on this side, if you will. Man, I feel such unity here. Is it always this good, or are y'all just behaving today? You know, when I find churches like this, I make a mental note of it. Because someday I'm not always going to be a general overseer. And when you're old and retired, and I've got just a year or two behind you, I may want to come pastor this church myself. Can we take my back is to them? I don't want to see what they're doing. They're probably going like this right here. So I'm not going to take a vote right now. That's not my job. I just want to tell you, I like what I feel here. I really do. 
Why haven't I been here before now? I'm not just saying that. I, I really am not just saying that. I go some places I can't wait to get out of there. But you may have to push me out of here today. You know why I think I like it? Because it reminds me of the church I was raised in. My dad pastored a church a lot like this one that helped shape me and form me. And here's what we're going to do. I want you to lift your hands toward your pastor. My goodness, what a gift. What a gift. How many years in this one church? 21, over 21. Wow. Wow. My goodness, I'm just trying to figure out. This crowd right here wasn't even around here 21 years ago. My goodness, a lot of you weren't. Lift your hands toward them. We're going to pray blessings upon this family. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, it's a beautiful thing to see such a wonderful gift that connects. Such a wonderful gift that is so perfect in God's eyes to match a harvest that you have put them in. And Lord, I feel that. I just sense that you have especially matched this pastor and his family with this congregation for these many years. And as a result, this church is practically full today and this community is touched by God. Father, I want to thank you for Brother Brackett today. I want to thank you for every sermon you put in his heart. God, when he'd walk in this auditorium when no one was here and he'd walk these aisles and he'd fall across these altars and weep before God or in his home study when he would just lay across the floor and he carried the burden of this church and said, God, I've got hurting people and I need to say something this week that'll help them. God, I thank you for Gail when, when she saw this man under the load and under the burden and building this church and everything that they've done for the kingdom of God. Lord, she'd steal away by herself in her own closet of prayer and she carried this man in prayer. She carried many of the people in this congregation in prayer and their families and their hurts and their sons and their daughters. God, I pray that you will reward her for that. I pray, God, for every member of the family that works in this church and serves on the staff. And God, they lay their own ministries down before the cross every day. God, I just pray that you'll bless them. God, I pray that you'll reward them for the years that they shared their father and mother with other people. And God, I pray for another generation. God, I pray for another generation that you will raise up to honor the Holy Spirit and honor the work of the Lord like their grandparents have done and their parents have done. God, raise up a generation, not only in the pastor's family, but in this congregation, Raise up missionaries, raise up evangelists, raise up other pastors that will go and start churches and make a difference in the kingdom. Father, I pray for this board. Oh God, such, such harmony, such unity. To be able to build such a beautiful church like this and have such fruitful, productive ministry. God, I thank you for the years that they have served and the hours that they've set around tables of discussion because they wanted what's best for this church and this community. Father, I pray for this congregation as a whole, as a unit. Father, bless them, keep them. God, you've kept this congregation safe over this last year and a half of this pandemic. God, I pray that you will continue to keep them, continue to bless them and help them in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Let's give Pastor and his family a real ovation of appreciation. Hallelujah. Man, I just love your spirit, buddy. I really do. I really do. Gail, I love your spirit. Paula sends her love and her greeting. Just reach over and just kind of touch somebody on their shoulder and say, I think he preached to you this morning. Yeah. Sister Amy, I'm going to give this to whoever needs to come and take it. I've had a wonderful time.
thank you so much. May God bless you. And if Jesus tarries, continue to give you great favor in this community. I love you all. God. has been today. We praise God for our able, wonderful general overseer today. Certainly it has been a blessing to celebrate this on 50 years of ministry with our pastor and family. 50 years, that, that is half a century. 50 years of struggles and successes. 50 years of trials and triumphs, 50 years of joy and sorrow, 50 years of groanings and growing. Today, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Pastor, you have come through as pure gold. Here you are sitting beside the general overseer of the church of God. Not only are you sitting in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, but earthly high places, and we praise God for that. Pastor and Sister Brackett, I praise God for you. I really do. I praise God for your two daughters who work with you faithfully and fervently in your ministry along with their families. I thank God for you, Pastor. I thank you, sir. You preach the undiluted word of God. You preach the word incorruptibly. And you preach the word uncompromisingly. And for that, I am so grateful. Evidently, you spend quality time in prayer and in the word. You do not download some sermon. You come every day in the sacred desk prepared to preach to us the word of God with power and authority in the Holy Spirit. And I honor you for that. And that is honoring to God who called you. And that's a respect to the people of God to whom you preach. You are a preacher's preacher. Just last week, you preached on this unusual topic, the runaway bride, from Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1. Now, where would you find a pastor who would preach two anointed, powerful sermons on the runaway bride? Only Pastor Rick Brackett. And what two great, anointed, and powerful preach, uh, mess messages th those were. My daughter said to me, um, Pastor Brockett is, is, is really credible to himself. It was, he really has great credibility to think of 50 years and he uses, he utilizes modern technology with such efficiency and, and quality. I love your PowerPoint preaching, Pastor. I really do. And you can see that he, he does the research and he comes prepared. And I, and I thank you for that. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to be long. Sister Amy warned me. But, <laughs> but I thank God for your, your faithfulness and your high honor in ministry. Above reproach, blameless. And I don't take that, especially in these days, slightly. When I say above reproach, 50 years in ministry, above reproach, that is credible. <laughs> Blameless, above reproach, that is credible. I thank you, Pastor, for your faithfulness, your consistency, your constancy, your, de de your devotion, and your steadfastness 
in carrying the work of the Lord. And we praise God for the wonderful, humble spirit that you have. We are so happy to be your sheep. And I believe from this place, you will be caught up to meet him in the air and to be with the Lord forever. So God bless you, Richard. Sister, Br Sister, Sister, Sister Brackett, you are such a precious gem. Thank you for your exemplary life. Thank you for your steadfastness and your faithfulness, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I appreciate you both. I'm going to ask you one more time to stand and put your hands together and just say, Pastor and Sister Brackett, we honor you. Just honor them. Thank you so very much. And did you see what I just, did you see what I see? The general overseer of the church of God just gave brother, pastor and sister Brackett a standing ovation. Pastor, it's such an honor today to celebrate with you this glorious milestone. You and Sister Brackett mean so much to me and my family. In 50 years in ministry, what a testament of who you are and what God has called you to do. You've never wavered and you've never stepped back from the call that God has had on your life. And Sister Brackett, along by your side, you guys have meant so much to me. Beth said it so good yesterday that you said yes. And why you said yes, there's so many attached to your yes, to the call to God. And I want to say that I know these 50 years hasn't come without a personal sacrifice to you and your family because of your commitment to the call to preach the word. You have a heart of compassion and genuine love for the people that has kept you weeping between the porch and the altar for lost souls and heavy burdens. You've never wavered in your preaching and you've never watered down the word. And for the past 21 years here at Matthew's Church of God, my family and I have had the wonderful privilege to have you as our pastor and we wouldn't want it any other way. From day one, when you walked in, you preached the whole word of God in truth and in spirit with every message filled with the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost. And it has been a privilege and honor to have you as my pastor to sit under your ministry and under serve under your leadership. God bless you both, and I love you. First Lady, Pastor, you never miss an opportunity to tell us how much you love us and how grateful you are that God brought you here to Matthews. But it's not lost on any of us that the Lord knew that we here at Matthews would need a shepherd like David, who's after, who has a heart after God, a watchman like Ezekiel, someone who prays for our souls like Joel, a prayer warrior like Elijah, a preacher like Jeremiah that has a fire shut up in his bones and loves us like Jesus. It is a high honor of God that he has brought us together for such a time as this to celebrate you and to honor you and the ministry that he ordained and has or uh, sustained through you for the last 50 years. We congratulate you and we love you. If you'll join us.
praise the Lord. God is good. And I love that little old song I've told you before. All my life, he has been faithful. All my life, he has what you do. He's been so, so good. And I praise him for what he's done in my life. And I praise him and thank him so much that he gave me my husband and our children and our grandchildren and our son-in-laws. And I praise him for giving us you. When we came here, we didn't come to move away or to look for a bigger, better. There isn't no bigger and better. But we came, every church that we've ever gone to, my husband would work that church. He would paint it if it needed painted. He would put uh, the yards if the yards needed, whatever. He would do that. He always went to stay. And I'm so thankful for him because he's a man of integrity. He's a man of his word. He's a man of God. And he's always preached the word. I've always loved good preaching. Always. From a child, I did. And God gave me a good husband that can preach the word. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate the word this morning, Brother Dr. Tim Hill. I appreciated that so much. It was so true. Because you know what? I don't want anything in my heart. I don't want to hold up a shield. I don't want to hold anything in my heart against anyone. If I can't have the love of God and the love for people, then I am nothing. I am nobody. But I'm so thankful that he gave me a heart of love and a heart of compassion. And when I was brought up in a godly home with 12 children, my, and my dad, a, a farmer, a sharecropper, and we knew what it was like to, to want or to need or sometimes, but we always had the best because God provided. And he'll do that. He'll do it every time. And I'm thankful for my godly heritage. And I'm thankful for God to you. These precious ladies, the best ladies around Brother Hill, they are precious. They've been good to me. The church has been so good to us. And I just praise him. And I just thank you and love you with all my heart. And there again, it's my pleasure to be your first lady. <laughs> Oh boy, my heart is so full. I feel the least so unworthy. I'm so thankful that 50 years ago on a Saturday night before a YPE service, praying in an altar, that I heard the call of God. And when he said, go and preach the word, I said, yes, Lord, yes. And I'm so thankful to be an ambassador, to be a mouthpiece, to be an instrument in the hand of God. Just to be able to serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is a great honor and a privilege. Amen. The song says, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I've already come. His grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Thank God for his grace. Wouldn't be here today without the grace of God, the mercy of God. We're all here today because of God's mercy, God's goodness to us. He has blessed us. And you know, I believe that Jesus is coming, and he's coming soon. And I want to finish this race. I want to finish what God has called me to do. I want to keep preaching until that day he appears. I'm looking for Jesus to come. I'm so blessed. I'm so honored, so privileged to be able to serve as your pastor and to be a part of this church. I tell everybody. This is the best kept secret in Western North Carolina. God has blessed our church over the years, and uh, he has brought us together, and I thank God for you. You're the, you're the best. You're the cream of the crop, and I thank God for every one of you and for my precious wife that he has given to me, such a great help me, such a blessing. I know she's a, a praying woman. There have been times when I have been dealing with some difficult situations in the church. Should be back at the house with some of the ladies pray. This prayer got us through. I thank God for that. Thank God that he's blessed me with two beautiful, wonderful daughters. Praise God and wonderful grandchildren. Amen. Involved in the ministry. I didn't mention my son-in-laws yesterday. Thank God for my son-in-laws. I would have two old maids at home. 
and no grandchildren. <laughs> Amen. Thank God for Troy and Ed that came along and blessed us with these wonderful grandchildren. My goodness, we are so blessed, so blessed of the Lord. And to be able to serve this church and to be a part of this great congregation, I am blessed and privileged. Uh, anytime the gentle overseer wants to call you by your middle name, that's okay. <laughs> Amen, that's okay. You know, I, it's kind of a, uh, most people, I'd say the majority of people don't know this, but my mom named me after a preacher named Daryl. So who knew that I would become a preacher? And when I got up that night, that Saturday night, and announced that God had called me to preach, she started crying. She told me recently before she passed, she said, you don't know this, but she said, I, I started praying, God, don't call him. Don't, he's too young. Don't let him be called to preach. He doesn't need to leave home yet. And she finally came to accept it. But um, she named me after a preacher, so it's her fault. <laughs> but that's okay. Amen. Thank God for his blessings today. And thank you so much for everything you've done. I appreciate you from the bottom of my heart. I pray for you daily. I call your names in prayer that God will continue to keep you and bless you. I pray for God to surround our property here to protect us and keep us safe. But I pray for him to surround you, keep you, protect you, to keep you safe. And ever since the former president announced that we were essential, which we already knew from the get-go, if anything is essential, it's the church. The church of God is essential. Not the ABC store, but the church of God is essential. As soon as he said, you're essential, then we opened the doors, and we've had them opened ever since. And Brother Hill, when we would come here with a, with a lockdown, with our little praise team, and we would preach to the pews and sing to the pews, while people gathered in the parking lot, we had the little FM transmitter. We were playing your songs over the FM transmitter for folks sitting in the parking lot pre-service. So uh, you've been here before and you didn't realize it. Praise God. God bless you. We love you with all our heart. Amen. Just a, a few things before we dismiss. Dr. Hill, wholeheartedly, thank you for being with us today. It was worth the wait. Every minute of it, we appreciate you being here to help us mark this milestone occasion. Please come back anytime you want. That's an open invitation. We would love to have you back. Um, and if anybody has an opportunity to, to visit the table out back there, uh, uh, Doug and Joni will be out there to assist you with that. Um, and we want to give thanks again to Sister Hensley and Sister Rushing for being with us today. What a joy it was to have you. What a delight. And you've done such a wonderful job. Um, just a couple of reminders, there is no service tonight, so if you come, we won't be here, but just we'll be back on regular service Wednesday night at 7, so please make plans to be. We have such a great time on Wednesday, so please make sure that you make that part of your schedule. Um, and then we are having the catered dinner next door for those who have signed up um, over in the fellowship hall. If you'll make your way over there and have a seat the way that we've done in the past, um, we'll have served the Brackett family and our guests. Um, and then we'll call by table. So we'll thank you in advance for your patience on that. Um, and also be sure to thank the ladies that are over there. They have worked so hard getting it all together and, and making it nice. And so just make sure that you give them a smile and a thank you when you go through. Um, and then I think that that, that is it. Thank you, guys. Um, we're, if, Rob, if you'll close us out in prayer, if we'll all stand um, and go ahead and say the blessing for the meal.